No serious stuff here. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Listen, listen now. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, asking him for a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them. And getting into the boat again, he went across to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread, just like those <laughs> disciples. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out! Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. They said to one another, Is it because we have no bread? And becoming aware of it, Jesus said to them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And they said to him, seven. Then he said to them, do you not yet understand? These words speak the power of life. They may be trusted. You know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you, John Tupper, uh, preached a remarkable sermon in which you talked about the importance of the table in the Christian tradition and in the life of this congregation. Uh, you relied on the work of an amazing pastor and teacher, Diana Butler Bass, uh, but you took her words about the table and how Holy Week is not so much about suffering and death and pain and hate, but rather about the presence of Jesus at the table, then and now, when we gather for worship. Uh, Jesus, the teacher, Jesus, the healer, Jesus, the savior, Jesus, the window, through whom we glimpse the power of God in our lives. Jesus at the table on Maundy Thursday, and the risen Jesus at table with his disciples and with us whenever we gather at the table, that we are not cross-centered people, but table-centered people. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Today, I, I want to build on that idea, and to do so, I'm going to talk about boats. <laughs> I, know, I know almost nothing about boats, uh, but one of the things I do know uh, is that church buildings often look like upside-down boats. And I also know that the church buildings I like best look like boats. And the ones I don't, or like a lot less, don't look like boats. Uh, this used to be our building, and we worship up the hill in another building. But both of those buildings look like boats. And someday, someday, I would like to preach a sermon on sacred architecture. Uh, I was tempted to do that today, and one of the things I might have said is that church buildings that look like boats have the best chance of nurturing disciples of the risen Jesus, and the churches that look like boxes seem to be those most likely to build God into a box and produce cookie-cutter Christians. Uh, recognizing that as I say that, it probably isn't true in most cases, but that's my, that's my prejudice. And, and that's another sermon uh, entirely. Uh, when, when Charlie and I joined this congregation, uh, one of the first services we attended, I think it was just a few weeks, uh, was the annual boat-in service. It poured down rain. Uh, just as the service was beginning, we got soaked. We moved inside, and those of you out there in the boats got a whole lot wetter. Uh, I remember on the way home thinking, more than thinking, actually saying, what was that all about? 
And I remember thinking, I sure hope I never have to preach at a boat in service. <laughs> well, here I am. Uh, Courtney tried everybody else, and, and I was his last hope. It, 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 until I heard John speaking holy words about the table, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to say until it occurred to me that just as we are table people called to live in the presence of Jesus, so too are we boat people. Whether we are sitting today in a boat or perched on the edge of a chair, let me tell you what I mean and confess to you that I am not using the assigned readings for today, but taking as my text the entire Gospel of Mark, which is probably a foolish and arrogant thing to do, take a whole Gospel, but anyway. Uh, that happens to be the Gospel that's assigned for most of the readings in this year of the lectionary. Uh, I selected a bit of the book to be read today, which I don't think is in the lectionary, but only after I decided to use the entire Gospel as my text. Now, what is, what is the Gospel of Mark about? Uh, I remember learning very early on uh, that Mark was the first Gospel written and the shortest. So if you ever want to read a Gospel and you want to get done quicker, choose the Gospel of Mark. Uh, that Mark seemed to be a person in a hurry, that he was anxious to convince people about the truth of the risen Jesus quickly because they truly expected that Jesus was going to return soon to judge the earth. The word immediately appears in the Gospel of Mark 28 times, 15 chapters, 28 appearances of the word immediately. The Jesus of Mark is, is a person in a frightful hurry. Uh, Mark has no Christmas story. You can, you can forget the month of December when it comes to Mark. Uh, there's not a single word about the early life of Jesus and precious few details about Jesus. Jesus springs in the first century Palestine as a complete surprise. He moves around quickly just for a few weeks or months. It's hard to tell the timing. And then of the 15 chapters, the last third of the book is about a single week, the last week of Jesus' life. There are few, very few parables in Mark. There's very little teaching. Most of the things you might remember about Jesus are simply not in the Gospel of Mark. There are no resurrection stories in the Gospel of Mark. The book ends only with fear and a promise of resurrection. That ending was so embarrassing to the early Christians that for the first hundred years or so, they composed several added endings to the Gospel of Mark. If you look at the Gospel, you'll see this clearly delineated by footnotes. Some of those later endings of the Gospel of Mark are absolutely bizarre. They include things like snake handling, for example. Uh, the book almost did not make it into the New Testament. It was so unpopular. Uh, now, absolutely none of that matters very much. Uh, unless things like this interest you and uh, make you want to go deeper uh, into what this is about, uh, which I'm happy to do another time, <laughs> since I love this stuff. <laughs> but for the time on this boat in Sunday, let's take a look at what is in Mark. The word faith. Faith is important, right? Appears only eight times in the Gospel of Mark. A little faith in Mark. The word hope. How important is the word hope? Not one single use of the word hope in Mark. No hope in Mark. What about love? Which I think all of us would agree is the most important thing. Appears a scant seven times. If love is all there is, there's not much love in Mark. <laughs> and how about the peace that passes understanding? The word peace only occurs in Mark three times. But what does Mark have in abundance? Boats! <laughs> Lots of boats! Eighteen separate passages contain the simple word boat, 
And if you came by boat today, dear friends, you came by one of the very few biblically sanctioned modes of transportation. <laughs> Jesus either walks or takes a boat. Uh, Mark only mentions him riding a colt once. Jesus was a boat person. Jesus calls his disciples out of their boats to fish for people. He escapes from crowds by boat. He travels with his followers by boat, and most of them were boat people. Jesus preaches in a boat. He teaches in a boat. He sleeps in a boat. People follow him around by boat. When the great windstorm threatens to sink the boats, Jesus, who is asleep in the boat, wakes up and by God's power stills the storm. And at that moment, the disciples, for the first time, by the power of God, see that power revealed in Jesus. This happens in a boat. Jesus steps out of a boat and heals the garrison demoniac who proclaims for the first time that Jesus is the Son of God. The first person, by the way, to do so. An outcast, a foreigner, a stranger, is the one who recognizes Jesus first. Now this terrifies the locals so much that they tell Jesus, get back on his darn boat and get out of town. He gets out of the boat on the other side of the sea and he heals people. So many people followed Jesus, he had to escape by boat to a lonely place. And in that place, the crowd which had followed were fed in the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. After this, an exhausted Jesus put his disciples in a boat and he went off to a lonely place to pray. The disciples off in a boat without Jesus had the wind against them and become terrified. Jesus comes walking through the midst to them on the water. And as soon as Jesus gets into the boat, the wind ceased and the fear disappeared with Jesus in the boat, there's no more fear. They landed the boat and Jesus stepped out of the boat and again, Jesus healed the sick. And then Jesus takes part in another feeding miracle. Mark has two, did you know that? The feeding miracle appears in all four gospels, but Mark has two and maybe a third hidden one. I might mention that later. Mark has two, and after the miracle, Jesus got into the boat, and when he got out of the boat, the Pharisees argue with him, and Jesus stills them like he stilled the storm, and then gets into a boat again. And as they're sailing along, in what we heard this morning, the hungry disciples remember that they only have one little loaf of bread, not enough. And Jesus uses the single loaf of bread to remind them all they're in the boat together that when they are in his presence, there will always, always be enough. But with that final trip by boat, Jesus leaves the boat behind and heads toward Jerusalem, teaching and preaching as he walks the way of the cross. Now, Every good sermon has to have a joke. It's time for a joke. Uh, I, I only know one boat joke, and I mo know that most boat owners don't think it's funny. <laughs> Question, what is the definition of a boat? Answer, a boat is a hole in the water into which you pour money. <laughs> now, if you laughed at that, you don't own a boat. <laughs> And if you didn't laugh, uh, you might own a boat and realize that you resemble that remark. <laughs> now, now let me ask, what do all of these boat appearances mean? Uh, first off, probably before Mark even began to write, the first Christian communities and gatherings used the boat as a metaphor for what they experienced together when they remembered Jesus and gathered at his table often meeting in secret, often persecuted, often huddling together in small groups, 
you all know the sign of the fish is the way they recognize one another. But when we were in the catacombs in Rome, we saw inscriptions on the wall of boats with the mast in the form of a cross. The boat became a symbol for their fellowship and for the hope that animated their lives. The storms they experienced personally and in a community were real, but the risen Jesus was in the boat and they knew they were not alone. Second, while the boat was a metaphor for community, it was also a powerful symbol that they were on a journey together that called them to get out of the boat and live for the sake of others. The feeding miracles happened when they left the boat. The healing miracles happened when they left the boat. The call to discipleship was a call to leave the boats behind and to live for others along the way of Jesus. You cannot, you cannot huddle in a spirit-led community and continue to claim to be spirit-led without daring to love your enemies and engage with the world in a way that acts for justice for the least and the lowest. Yes, we have the boat. We have the community, the nurture we receive as gifts of a loving God. But the unconditional gift of God's grace calls for giving and caring and service in a world beyond the boat, way beyond the island. One more thing. I, uh, I have a strong feeling, dear ones, uh, that the days coming are going to test what it means to be boat people for the sake of Jesus. Some folks seem to imagine that the way of Jesus involves preparing the boat for violence, figuratively or literally bringing guns on board. Some folks seem to want to welcome only those who think like them or gender like them or pigment like them into the boat. Some folks have this notion that an exclusive boat is a faithful boat. Well, to my way of thinking, the best way to make sure that Jesus is not with you in the boat or that Jesus will miss the boat you are sailing is to make no room in the boat for the least and the lowest or the most unlikely. That your boat is in the water without the risen one. If you are gathering only with the folks who look most like you or think most like you into community, or by confusing the way of unconditional love with lots of conditions that separate and judge others. Saints, sheltering in a boat with Jesus is a categorical contradiction of the prime directive to love, period. In settings like that, Jesus by definition is missing. It's never, never, dear ones, saints in the boat, and sinners out in the sea. It's sinners in the boat working on ways to love their way to sainthood, seeking the courage, seeking the courage to get out of the boat and get busy. And in that process, the boat is supposed to be getting bigger, not smaller. The boat Jesus is supposed to be on is taking on new passengers, not not throwing them overboard. The Jesus boat is the boat that comforts, confronts, and challenges all of us to reach out and care all at the same time. All at the same time. Loving Jesus, may we all become boat people in the same way that we are people of the table. Amen.